All right. I want to welcome you guys back into the sanctuary. We're going to go ahead and get started. As uh, Jared already said, my name is Tim Downey. I guess I am the Tim Downey. The Tim Downey. There's a the in the beginning. Um, I am the director of student ministries here at River City Church, and I'm excited to continue our series, People of the Spirit. The series has been awesome so far. Um, before I do, I have one more announcement that I wanted to make because I sort of started this announcement, and that is about the All Nations Soccer League Serve Day. And if you don't know what this is, so this is kind of kind of crazy how this all happened, but a group of guys from RCC started playing pickup soccer, and it started there, we were having fun, and then it turned into this, actually this really cool like ministry partnership with this soccer ministry called All Nations Soccer League, and they've existed in Jacksonville for about five years, and there's, um, the, the heart of this league is to connect with and reach out to internationals, refugees that have relocated to Jacksonville for various uh, reasons, and I love soccer because it's a universal sport, it just brings people together. And so what, what we've been invited to do as a church is host a game day. So there's been eight, there's eight games total. And so I was like, okay, let's do this. Let's try this. On April 9th, we are going to be trying to host a game day. And what that means is we're, I'm looking for if like 15 to 30 volunteers to come out. And it's pretty simple. We'll just go out there. We'll pass out water. You know, we'll make connections with the players, with the referees and field staff, and with the families who are out there. Uh, maybe there'll be some opportunities to just talk with people and pray with people. Um, it's been really fun so far. Um, we got a, a, a handful of guys. We got Rudy on the team. We've got uh, Raphael. I know there's a picture of Raphael. Yeah, we got Raphael Solaro. Um, just looking so fierce out there. Uh, we have Ryan Baker showing off a lot of his tricks. And uh, in this next one, he's got a new profile picture. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> got you, Ryan. Yeah, I see you, Ryan. Nice. And then there's me out there. I am in this picture. Um, I'm, behind, I'm behind that guy who has the ball. He probably took the ball from me. And I'm just checking on the ants. I'm making sure they're all doing okay, okay? I'm pretty gas, as you can tell. Uh, but we're, ha we're having fun. And so anyway, I just want to invite you out. I think we have five people signed up so far. So if you want to come out and just support us, River City's going to be playing at 6 p.m. that day. We have a team. It's River City FC, River City Football Club. How cool is that? You know what I'm saying? I don't know. I don't know how it happened, but we're having fun. Um, but yeah, come out, the game's going to be at six, and then you can just enjoy being out there. So yeah, I'm excited to be giving the talk today and continue on in this series. Um, hopefully the talk goes well. Communication, good communication is hard, right? Good communication is hard. And you know what else is hard? Family communication. Family communication is very hard. Communication with a five-year-old, a four-year-old, and a two-year-old is very hard. Those are my, the ages of my kids. Um, in my house, uh, Indy is at the bottom at two years old, and she is fighting to be understood. I mean, at the table, you should see her at the table just constantly saying something. Half the time, we have no clue what she's saying. Um, Indy, is, you know, communication is her weak point, but Boy, is she cute. I mean, she is the cutest thing. Um, she calls uh, cookies tutti. Uh, she, she, uh, Bawo is sparrow, in case you didn't know. Uh, Bima is grandma or grana. My mom sitting right here. That's you, Bima. And uh, milk is meot. Meot. It's, it's super cute. And then at the top of the lineup, we have Ellie, and Ellie is our over-communicator. She is very skilled at expressing herself in all kinds of ways, and she has a high level of awareness of her feelings, so she's always kind of explaining what she's feeling. And, uh, you know, praise God, a lot of emotions in my house, all girls <laughs> except for me. Um, Ellie doesn't always get the word right, but she gives so much context that you know exactly what she's saying. So the other night, she came into the living room, it's past bed, we put him to bed an hour before, she comes in, we're watching a show or talking, whatever, and she goes, mommy and daddy, I have a lot of flimic in my throat. 
And the flemic keeps coming up. I guess that's the Hebrew pronunciation of phlegm. The flemic keeps coming up and I can't sleep, but it's okay because I swallow it every time it comes up and it comes back up and I swallow it again. And she's like, I'm fine, I'm fine. And then she walks out. We're like, we didn't even have to tell her to go back to bed. It was the funniest thing. Um, and then my middle child, Sparrow, God bless her, she, she gives us a run for our money. Um, she is very hard to understand because she is very spontaneous and random, and her mind just drifts off to like the most random places. Um, the other night, I, I, I had a zit. For the first time in a while, I was like, oh, I got a zit. Um, kind of. That's like one of the advantages of like growing older as a man, I guess. You don't get it. So Sparrow looks at me. She hasn't seen one. And she looks at my face, and, and she's like staring at it. And I'm like, oh, that's great. Just stare at it. I'm brushing her teeth. And she goes, Daddy, is that where the lobster bit your face? <laughs> and I'm like, when have we talked about lobsters or any kind of conflict between me and lobsters? It's, and of course, she, she pronounces it wobster. So is that where the lobster bit your face? Um, and then lastly, marriage communication, right? Marriage communication is on a whole nother level of hard. I mean, you who are married, are you with me? Um, Melissa and I, we've actually been in this season just so thankful for the marriage mentors here at River City Church, just teaching us basic things about communication, learning how to understand each other and go deeper in connection with each other. And uh, we are learning that just saying babe in different tones is not enough to express how you're feeling to each other. At first we were like, babe, 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 babe. We're like getting closer, babe, 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 no babe, come on babe. And so we're learning how to like take our communication to a deeper level and I'm thankful for that. Um, but yeah, I don't know about you, but um, I struggle to be understood. There are times in my life where I've just felt like nobody gets it, you know, that nobody really understands or feels what I'm feeling and understands what I'm trying to say, and hopefully I don't have to feel that at the end of this talk, um, <laughs> but I think it's true for all of us that we've all felt the pain of rejection that comes when you don't feel known or you don't feel understood, and, and uh, that Everybody, all of us, are, we have this desire or need to be understood, to understand and to be understood, to know and to be known. We all have a desire to be accepted for who we are. But at first, you have to be known, right? First, you have to be understood. And I think the question is, what, where is our ultimate source for that? Where is our ultimate source for these things? Melissa Snow uh, gave the talk last week, and it was awesome. Um, at the end of her talk, she mentioned that there's a place in Jesus that we can experience true love and true worth and true acceptance. And I want to pick up where she left off last week. Um, she talked about John chapter 3, and we're going to be looking into John chapter 4 today. And we get this beautiful picture of God's acceptance um, that's in the story of the woman at the well, where Jesus has the longest recorded conversation in the Gospel of John, and it's an unexpected conversation. So we'll just start reading in John chapter 4. It says that, now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciple, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. He was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. 
So let's just set the stage for this conversation for a second. First of all, Jesus takes the shortcut. I love that about Jesus. He's practical, right? He is ready to, to take the short route. And he goes the shortcut through Samaria, which wasn't a very common route for a Jew to take from Galilee to Jerusalem. Um, they, they would typically take the traditional route, which as you can see from this map, is the dotted line that kind of wraps around the territory of Samaria. Um, so it's not a common route, but it also wasn't unheard of. In fact, uh, Josephus actually says, the first, his, uh, first century historian says that for rapid travel, it was essential to take the route by which Jerusalem could be um, uh, reached in three days from Galilee. And so we know that it happened sometimes, but it wasn't common because the Jews avoided Samaria. And so like, I guess the way I see it is like Apple Maps would have taken you like the dotted line, like the long way around, whereas Waze like takes you through Samaria. Um, <laughs> So from the high school ski trip, I think Gartrell and I are both in agreement that like Waze knows best and is going to get you there the quickest. And I'm sorry, Tom, Rossi, and Kevin for having to follow us in your bus because we were, we were everywhere. But he's, he's taking the quick route. I love that. And, he, and you see on the map where it says Sakars and where it says Jacob's Well, and he stops, he stops there. He's, he's thirsty, so he stops for a drink. And I love this about um, this story because it shows the humanity of Jesus. You know, we worship Jesus as God. We worship him as fully God. And yet he was a man just like we are. Like he was human. He thirsted, And so he's, he's on his journey and he's thirsty and there's no Wawa on the way, but there is Jacob's well. And so he, he stops and he asks a drink from the Samaritan woman. And in verse 8, it gives us this nice little parenthetical. It says, Jews didn't associate with Samaritans. I love when the Bible gives us a little parentheses. I'm like, I wish it would just do it after every single line so we know exactly what's going on here. Um, so it tells us, like, she's shocked. Why are you asking a drink? Because Jews don't have dealings with Samaritans. But then the question is, why? Why don't they? And, and here's why, just to get into, like, the Samaritan history a, a little bit in the Jewish history. Samaritans, they were Israelites by blood, so they were descendants of Jacob. But during the Babylonian exile in 597, they were kind of scattered throughout the region of Samaria. And then because they were there scattered throughout Samaria, they decided, okay, we're gonna build our own temple to worship Yahweh. And when they built it, they were like, this is the place of worship. This is the right place to worship Yahweh. Now, on the other hand, and that was on uh, uh, Mount Gerizim, so it's a different mountain. On the other hand, you have the Jews who built their temple um, on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, and they said, this is the right place to worship Yahweh. So they're technically kind of worshiping the same God, but in two different places, and both of them thought that their place was the right place to worship God. And they had this, this theological rivalry going on where they were, you know, they just didn't agree about the, the temple, but there was also some other things, like the Samaritans only believed in the first five books of the Bible, the, the Pentateuch, so they rejected the, the prophets, they rejected the, the, the writings of poetry, like the Psalms and Song of Solomon, they rejected Jeremiah, Isaiah, they didn't believe they were part of, you know, the, the word, and, and on top of that, they also intermarried with the people who um, had invaded the Assyrians, they began to intermarry with the Assyrians, and so what was introduced to their Jewish faith was um, a lot of kind of paganism and pagan faith. And so that for the Jewish people was like a, a no-go. You know what I mean? Um, they, for the Jews, Samaritans were impure and despised. And so they had these layers of racial and social prejudices and religious prejudices. So that is the, the, um, the stage, if you will, for this conversation, because she is floor that Jesus would be talking to her and her being a woman, which that wasn't common either for a man just to engage in a conversation with a woman alone like that. And so here is Jesus, a Jew, pursuing a conversation with a Samaritan woman. 
Now, I want to uh, go back to where it says it was the sixth hour. What that means is that the time of day, it was about noon. So it was right in the middle of the day. And I think it's so cool that he meets her in the middle of the day. Because if you look back and you contrast it to John chapter 3, what you see is that he met Nicodemus in the middle of the night. And so when you look in John chapter four, he's meeting her in the middle of the day. As Melissa talked about last week, Nicodemus was kind of afraid to be seen with Jesus. And so he kind of secretly meets with him in the night. But Jesus is not afraid to be seen with this woman. And he meets her in the middle of the day. And it's significant because a lot of commentators will say that it would have been customary for women nearby to retrieve water together from the well early in the morning, right? Because people don't usually go to a well at the hottest time of the day in the Palestinian desert, right? They are looking to get it in a cool, and women might have, you know, walked together to go get, retrieve water, or they might have had a conversation on the way, or maybe they would have met someone at the well, and it would have been kind of this social experience. But here's this Samaritan woman who goes in the middle of the day, and she's alone, in the hottest, most exhausting time of the day, walking miles outside of the city to get water. And what we can see from this, I think, is that she's probably avoiding people, right? She's probably not trying to be seen by other people. She's avoiding the crowd. And as we get to know her circumstances a little bit better in in just a minute, we get a picture as to why she was alone, that she might have been actually an outcast, maybe even a topic of gossip, for the other people. And here she was hiding, hiding in broad daylight, which really is right where Jesus likes to meet us, isn't it? And uh, Jesus, breaking all these cultural, social boundaries, shocks her and asks for a drink. And we continue to read in John in uh, verse 10, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that's saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well, and he drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of living water welling up from, uh, to eternal life. And so he, he asked her for a drink and he said, if you knew who I was, you would have asked me for a drink. And he talks about this, this living water. And this is kind of where you want another one of those parentheses because he doesn't explain to her what the living water is. You get the explanation actually later in John chapter seven and Jesus is in Jerusalem at the Feast of the Tabernacles and on the last day of the feast, it says that, uh, and you don't know this from John seven, but there's this water purification ritual that happens on the last day of the feast and Melissa referenced Ezekiel 37. And did anybody do their homework and read Ezekiel 30? She gave us homework. I did my homework, y'all. I was like, wow, we're getting homework at RCC. Ezekiel 37 talks about this promise from God that he will sprinkle Israel with water. And that was what was happening on the last day of this feast Jesus is at, is there's this sprinkling ritual that happens. And as the ritual is happening, it says in verse 37, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and he cried out. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the spirit, because those who believed in him were to receive, for just as yet the spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So going back to John 4, this is what he's talking about. He's talking about, the Holy Spirit. He's, he's inviting this, this woman to, the, to, the, to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus cried out in John 7, just as he does today, come and drink. This is a powerful invitation for all of us. This is a powerful invitation. 
to drink from a spring of living water that quenches every thirst that we have and it wells up to eternal life, to drink of the Holy Spirit, that whoever believes in Jesus would be satisfied by God as he makes his home inside of us. <laughs> How awesome is that? And I don't, wanna, I don't want this to sound trite, but when I read this passage, I can't help but think of all the times that I have gone to other wells, to other sources of water that haven't satisfied me. And we all do that. We all go to wells that don't satisfy. We go to the well of money and materialism. We go to the well of physical comfort and temporary pleasure, the well of career and social status. Some of us just go to the well of human relationships, just drinking of the affirmation of others. And however powerful human relationships can be, we're still searching for love from people who are just people and can't give us the life that we need, the source of water that flows from within. These are all just broken wells. All of these sources will ultimately leave us dry, empty, and void of true purpose. So all of us need that kind of fulfillment that Jesus speaks of. The promise of relationship with God and the promise of the Holy Spirit offered to this Samaritan woman. And whether or not she asks it um, facetiously or seriously, she goes, where can I get this water? Can you give me some? Can I have some? So she asks Jesus in verse 15, she says, sir, give me this water so I won't be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. And the woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. So she's, she's found out. He knows, he knows who she is. And you know, I've thought a lot about this woman. I've, I love, this is one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible, and I think that... Um, you know, I thought a lot about what her situation actually was, and we don't get a lot from the conversation, but there's a lot of cultural evidence to kind of suggest at least a couple different situations that she might be in. Um, we already know that in their culture, um, it was patriarchal and that it was unfair toward women, right? We know that uh, women were divorced without cause um, while they couldn't actually issue a divorce, and many widows were left in poverty during that time, and remarriage was often the means of survival, physical survival. Um, so it could have been that maybe she was just abused and had been abandoned five times over by these men, and, and that even the current relationship she's in, he's not willing to like really commit to her. It could have been that. And then another thought or interpretation would be that maybe she's not your conventional woman, okay? She's, she's in this time, but she's not your conventional woman. Maybe she was married, but in this extramarital relationship um, that was happening while she was married. And the fact that she was alone at the well, I think, demonstrates that she was probably judged by others um, and was there alone because of it. And maybe it's because she was just a hard woman to satisfy emotionally, physically. I don't know. But she had physical security, but what was still searching for love and was not satisfied in her heart. And so she's in this relationship. But in either case, in either case, it didn't stop Jesus from pursuing her. It didn't stop Jesus from seeing her. He doesn't care that she's Samaritan. He doesn't care that she is an, maybe an outcast. Jesus sees her as worthy. He sees her as worthy. And I don't know how Jesus does it, but he gets this word of knowledge. You know, I don't know if it was like he just like before he even got to the well, like he just had it all like given to him by the father or if in the moment, like suddenly the spirit speaks to him and he's like, I know exactly what her situation is. But he has this word of knowledge about her. But you kind of have to read this and ask, why does he bring up her marital status? Because it kind of sounds a lot on, on just the surface level like maybe he's 
judging her. And so the question is like, does he bring it up to cause her shame? Does he bring it up, you know, to make her feel judged? And I don't think so. And I don't think, I don't think that's true at all. I think, um, in fact, he doesn't even really condemn the status of her relationship. All he says is, what you said is true. What you said is true. He's just saying, hey, exactly what you said. So why does he bring it up? I think Jesus knew that when he presents to her this promise that you can be filled with living water, the first thing she's gonna think of is how her past and how her sin disqualifies her, right? The first thing that she's gonna think of is, that's not for me. If he knew who I really was, I would not be invited to drink from that water. It's because she's felt the pain of rejection. And he wanted her to see first that he knows her. He wanted her to see first that he understands her past, he understands um, all that she is, and he accepts her, and then he offers her the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I imagine she's probably shocked, so she changes the subject. And, and reading on, it says, she, she tells him, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. This is the next verse, verse 20. And Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you don't know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, he who is called the Christ, and when he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. It's amazing. He addresses this theological conflict head on between the Samaritans and the Jews, and he says, neither of them have it right. In fact, the Father is looking for people who are gonna worship in truth and in spirit. Okay, and that's, so what he's basically saying here is that it's not about where you worship, it's not about how you worship, but it's about in whom you worship. And I love, we've been getting these uh, RCC emails um, as we've been tracking along with this series, and one of the emails um, wrote this about this subject. It says, uh, to worship in spirit is to worship God wherever we are and whatever we're doing. The Holy Spirit now indwells us. To worship in truth is to worship the God who has revealed himself in his word and in his son. That we don't have to choose between spirit and truth. In fact, the two get married together in our worship. They, they get married together. And um, here's a quote uh, David Platt says about this. He says that without the spirit, Worship is hypocrisy, and worship without the truth is idolatry. It's hypocrisy because we're all dead. None of us can worship if it wasn't for Jesus raising us back to life and uh, enabling us to worship, right? And it's idolatry because without the truth, we don't know who we're worshiping. We could be worshiping anything, and ultimately, People tend to find themselves worshiping themselves, right? That's kind of inevitable. So it's, it's idolatry. And then I love this other quote by Mike Bickle. Uh, Mike Bickle, the um, leader of the House of Prayer. He says that if we have the word without the spirit, we dry up. If we have the spirit without the word, we blow up. But if we have the word and the spirit, we grow up. That if we're able to, to um, marry the two of those things, walking and worshiping in the spirit and in the truth, we'll find ourselves maturing in who we are as God's people. And I get it. Sometimes in worship, the Holy Spirit can get a little wild, right? Um, but we can't ignore that God's spirit is filling all different kinds of people all over the world from every type of, um, of cultural background. And I love it. Um, the first time, you know, when, when I was 16, I was in Africa and I discovered that um, worship in Africa is kind of like one big dance party. And it shocked me. I was like, wait a second. This is like blowing my mind because I thought like true worship was like Christian rock like DC talk, jars of clay. And I was like, that's the only way I'm gonna be able to like 
meet with God and worship. And there it was like this, it was this joy fest of dancing. And I was like, this is blowing my mind. And I was kind of aggravated, but God had to open my eyes to it. And worship in spirit is to celebrate the freedom of expression of the Holy Spirit throughout the body of Christ all over the world. That it flows from people who have grateful hearts and, and God just breaks open the boxes in our minds and he, and he shows us. And I love it. The Bible says make a joyful noise, right? Not a pretty one. So that's, that's good news. Um, here's another quote from the RCC email. Our worship does not grow out of our expressions of praise in music or the ambience in a room which we gather. The reason for and the energy behind our worship of God is gratitude, a reaffirmation of the life-centering truth that all we are and all we have came to us, not from our own efforts, but from him. So worship has to be rooted in truth. And there was a time, I wanna share a quick story before I bring it home. Um, there was a time when I was in Bible college, I went to Southeastern University, and I was, uh, a, I think I was a senior, I was taking theology too, and in Theology 2, we got to do fun things like compare the, the nine different views of eschatology in the Bible, right? Doesn't that sound fun? Um, so in Theology 2, I, I got to a place where I was so overwhelmed by the amount of disagreement, call it what you will, about the Bible that I just started getting anxious. You know, when I started studying the seven different theories of the atonement and like, what it really meant that Jesus died for us. I'm like, can't we just say Jesus died for us, you know? And I was, I was overwhelmed and I got to a point where I was like, I don't even know if I wanna learn anything more because I'll never arrive at the full knowledge of the truth. Like there'll always be something I don't know and people kind of arguing about it. And uh, a friend of mine showed me this passage and, and he goes, look, I know you're concerned with like getting it all right just the way the Bible says it. And I was like, yeah, because I'm gonna be a pastor and I don't wanna be, I don't wanna be a heretic. I wanna like speak the truth. And, and they, they show me this verse in 1 John. It says, I write to you these things about whom you're, who are trying to deceive you. The anointing that you received from him abides in you and you have no need that anybody teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. And in that moment, like all the, the fear of like knowing everything just kind of broke off me. And I realized that I, I had the anointing of the Holy Spirit, that he was in me to teach me what I needed to know about Jesus when I needed to know it. And that if I abided in him, it didn't matter if I was a Bible scholar, it just mattered that I was a Christian. It just mattered that I knew him. And I'm not advocating truth being relative. I believe Jesus is absolute truth, but I think he's trying to show us as a church something. And I think that he wants us to, to lay down what we think we know and continue to make our worship all about him. That our worship has to be about him. It can't be about what we think. And in many ways, the rivalry between the Jews and the Samaritans that was happening, I think it reflects some of the division that we experience in the, the church today, right? It reflects this, you know, rivalry that we have. And I think this is a word from Jesus to us telling us not to allow our worship expressions or our theological differences to become bigger and more important than our call to worship together and to love other people the way that Jesus loved this Samaritan woman. And so my, my hope and my heart is that we would continue to be a church that just loves well. So how would she have experienced this word, this woman, to worship in spirit and in truth? It would have been liberating for her. Like she was caught up in this world of division and unknown, and this would have been freedom. For her to be able to worship in spirit and in truth meant that she could be free not to hide anything from God. She didn't have to hide anymore. She didn't have to lie and cover up her sin. She didn't have to cover up her shame. She could be honest with God and know she is accepted and loved. She could lay down the anxiety of feeling like she'll never understand because Jesus invites her to receive the Holy Spirit and to rest in him. And she's waiting for the Messiah. And I wanna point out that 
Jesus didn't tell Nicodemus who he was. He didn't actually tell Nicodemus that he was the Messiah, but he told this woman. And it was the first person that he tells. Isn't that amazing? Is this woman at the well, and suddenly she, she experiences this living water begin to bubble up from within her, and she goes and starts telling everybody in the town nearby, I met a man who knew everything about me, which I love, because he told her one thing about her, but she felt so seen and so loved and so known that she goes, he knew everything. He knew everything. And then people began to, to believe. And so um, that's happened to me before. I don't know if it's ever happened to you, but I've been in, in times, whether in church, actually there's been times even outside of the church that I've had someone come up and be like, I have something I need to say to you that I think is from God. And they say it. And it was like, they just knew me. They just read what was going on. There's been so many times where I've come forward for prayer here at River City where one word from somebody is like this amazing confirmation that God sees me, that he knows me, and that he's, he's called me to receive his Holy Spirit. And um, let's just all stand up. I know we've gone a little bit long. Let's just kind of stand up because I think the Lord wants to do something in all of us on this issue of acceptance, and we've all experienced different levels of rejection, um, different levels of shame from relationships. Um, every one of us has gone to wells that don't satisfy. Every one of us have found ourselves trying to get life from something that was never meant to source the life that God can only give us. And so, we're all at the well right now. We're all there at the well with Jesus. And I just invite you just to, just to close your eyes and just to hold out your hand as we, uh, hands like this as we close in prayer. And we're just gonna have a moment of silence where we just wanna listen to what he has to say. What would Jesus speak to you about what you're trying to quench your thirst with? Is it security? Is it acceptance? Maybe it's your image or the way people see you. I just hear Jesus saying, come to me and drink. Come to me and drink. You've been fighting with us a long time. You've been struggling with this a long time. I wanna give you a new source, a river of living water. Jesus, I just thank you that you know us. I thank you that you see us. But there's never been a time in my life that you haven't seen me completely, known me completely, loved me completely. And God, we lay down today the thing that we go to and we receive the Holy Spirit. We say, come Holy Spirit. We acknowledge you, Holy Spirit. Come and flow this morning.